Is it possible to do things to actively become luckier in life? Well, the answer is apparently yes. That is what this book talks about, The Luck Factor, which is what we're talking about in this episode of Book Club, the ongoing series where we distill and discuss highlights and summaries from some of my favorite books. Now, The Luck Factor is a book that was published in 2002 by psychology professor Richard Wiseman, who I actually had on my Deep Dive podcast recently. And he's done a bunch of studies on over a thousand people that look at the differences between people that rate themselves as lucky versus unlucky versus neutral. And through those experiments, him and his research team have come up with a few foundational principles and a few strategies that all of us can apply to our lives from today to substantially increase the amount of luck that we have in our lives. Anyway, in this video, we're gonna first talk about the four principles for creating luck. And then we're gonna go through five evidence-based tips for actually implementing these in practice. And he's got 12 of these tips in the book, but these are five of my favorite ones. Part one, the four luck principles. The first luck principle is that lucky people create, notice, and act upon the chance opportunities in their life. So these are the principles, the different ways in which people lucky, which lucky people think and behave. So we have their open to opportunities, and when those opportunities come along, they make the most of them and you saw that all the time they're, they're very flexible so they've got an end point they knew they wanted to i don't know be successful or you know financially uh, well off or whatever it was but the way they were going to get there they didn't really know they, they were looking at the way the wind was blowing and then setting sail to make the most of that very flexible so lucky people tend to be happier to try out stuff and then figure out what works whereas unlucky people on the other hand i.e the people in richard's studies who have rated themselves as unlucky when he's done all these correlations to figure out what separates lucky people from unlucky people the people who are unlucky tended to be the ones that focused on planning and trying to get certainty about decisions before actually making the decisions and so generally in richard's studies the sorts of people who had more outgoing personalities who exposed themselves to opportunities for lucky events to happen to them and then took advantage of those lucky events, those were the people that kind of rated themselves as luckier and then were also happier in all the kind of life satisfaction surveys that he and his team did. Interestingly, people who were more extroverted tended to be luckier because they just met more people and actively struck up conversations with strangers and coffee shops and that kind of thing. That tends to lead to more lucky breaks in your life. People who are more relaxed also tend to be luckier. So the more stressed and anxious you are, the more like defensive you are in the way that you approach life. Whereas if you can take a deep breath and generally approach life in a more relaxed fashion, then you're more likely to be able to see kind of the things in your peripheral vision, as it were, and take advantage of those opportunities. And thirdly, if you're the sort of person who's more open to new experiences, novel experiences and new things also tend to lead to luckier breaks in life. You tend not to get very lucky when you're focused on just doing exactly the same thing you've always done because you like your routine or whatever. You tend to become luckier when you start to become open to new experiences. The second luck principle is that lucky people make successful decisions by using their intuitions and gut feelings. Second, they tend to trust their intuition. And so when they get that gut feeling, they really do treat it as an alarm bell and take it quite seriously. Now, when Richard ran these studies comparing lucky and unlucky people, he found that 90% of people who identified as lucky tended to trust their intuition. And 80% of them said that intuition and gut feeling played a really important role in their career. Now, this intuition stuff can sound a bit rogue sometimes, but when they talk about intuition in the field of psychology, they often treat it rather than as some mystical, magical thing. It's more like the subconscious parts of our brain giving us a signal about something that we can't consciously appreciate. And the theory behind this is that our subconscious brains can pick up on patterns and stuff in the outside world and can pick up on data that our conscious brains just don't have the computing power or awareness to be able to process. And so when you get like a bad feeling or a bad vibe about something, that's like your subconscious integrating tons and tons of signals into that particular vibe check. And so you can use that seriously as an alarm bell to not do something. Or if you get a really good feeling about something, you can tend to use that as a good feeling for doing something. The third luck principle is that lucky people's expectations about the future help them fulfill their dreams and ambitions. Third, they're optimists. And so that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. They, they kind of continue in the face of failure and, and so on. And the reason why optimism and high expectations tend to lead to you being luckier and more successful in life is because of something called the Pygmalion effect. And this came from an absolutely classic study that was done in 1968 by Harvard psychologists. And they looked at the roles of how teachers' expectations affected the performance of their students. So these psychologists got a bunch of school kids to do a test. And then they told them that the test would identify who the late bloomers were. And they told their teachers who the late bloomers were based on these test results. In reality, the test was actually fake and the researchers just randomly chose some students as being the late bloomers or the students that were gonna struggle. But even though the test was fake, it had a huge effect on what the teachers expected from the students and how the students went on to perform. The teachers treated those fake late bloomers differently and they also ended up doing worse than the non-late bloomers. And so the idea here is that if you have an external or an internal label that you are bad at something or you have low expectations, that's actually gonna to contribute to your performance. And this has been repeated in a bunch of different ways. And so generally being a a little bit more optimistic in our thinking can help us become luckier and more successful. And the fourth luck principle is that lucky people are resilient and able to transform their bad luck into good fortune. I think it's probably the most important principle. Uh, they're extremely resilient. So when bad things happen, 
they could bounce back. Now, obviously no one is lucky all the time, but what it seems that lucky people do is that they tend to bounce back from failure. When we chatted in the podcast, Richard shared a story about a guy who fell down the stairs and broke his leg. Let's call this guy Mr. Lucky. And so Richard said to Mr. Lucky, I bet you don't consider yourself quite so lucky now. But to Richard's surprise, Mr. Lucky told him that the last time he went into hospital, he fell in love with a nurse and now the two of them are happily married 25 years later. He said that breaking his leg was the single best thing that had ever happened to him. And so really it's this idea that people who consider themselves lucky tend to bounce back and be more resilient when bad things happen in life. And there's a nice quote from Martin Seligman, who's the founder of the positive psychology movement, where he wrote, optimists endure the same storms in life as pessimists, but they weather them better and emerge from them better off. Okay, so those were the four principles that separate lucky people from unlucky people. Let's now talk about five evidence-based tips that Richard shares in the book for how to incorporate more luck into your own life. Technique number one, create a luck diary. So we saw that the first luck principle is to create lucky opportunities for yourself. But to do this, we need to get better at noticing opportunities that could generate positive experiences and open doors. And this is what the idea of a luck diary tries to do. It's sort of similar to a gratitude journal and how a gratitude journal focuses your mind on the things that are good in the world. Similarly, a luck diary helps you notice events when luck is on your side. And if you can incorporate that into your journaling habit, it helps you notice more lucky opportunities in life. So the luck diary, the end of each day, you write down a sense of gratitude you have for your friends or health or yep. career or whatever, it was on gratitude intervention, or the best thing that's happened in the last 24 hours, or something negative that used to happen that no longer happens. Okay. And what that means is you start to build up a written record and you do have to write it. Mm. If you just think it, it doesn't work. Mm. You start to build up a written record of how lucky you are, how fortunate you are, mm. how good your life is. And that starts to then change people's self-perception. Technique number two, build a network of luck. Now, you've probably heard the saying that to be more successful, it's not about what you know, it's about who you know. And I've never vibed with this because I always felt a bit like networking and a bit weird. But when it comes to luck, like <laughs> there's just so much stuff in the book and so much evidence around how the people that actually maximize their network opportunities in a non-weird way, like those tend to be the luckier people. For example, in my life, so many things have happened through just ra a random person I met on Twitter or on the street who recognized me or at a conference I went to, all of the good things in my life, I can kind of trace back to a completely serendipitous, lucky encounter with a random person by virtue of the fact that I put myself out there and I did a thing and I spoke to someone or replied to someone's Twitter DM or whatever that might be. And as I was rereading the book, this was one of the things that most struck, stuck with me because a lot of lucky people tend to, for example, strike up conversation with people in coffee shops or in queues or whatever. And I tend not to do that. Like I kind of had a phase where I used to do that back in the day when I was actively trying to work on becoming more confident and like more assured. But then I, I now kind of stopped and I'm on my phone. I'm always listening to an audiobook. And so as I was reading this book, I was thinking, damn, I've probably let so many interesting opportunities pass by me by virtue of just not striking up conversation and not just doing my best to maintain my network of friends and colleagues and associates. And so that's like a real practical tip that I'm taking away from the book myself. Anyway, in the book, Richard talks about two potential exercises that you can do to help increase your lucky network. The first exercise is something called Connect Four. And basically the idea here is that every week you make it a point that your, your job is going to be to speak to someone that you don't know. So it could be an interaction in a shop or in a coffee shop or on the road or in a bus or whatever. Your job is every week to make one of these new connections or at least talk to someone. And then the second exercise, which I'm going to try and do myself, is called the contact game, where again, the challenge is that every week your job is to make contact with someone that you haven't been in touch with for a while. So this could be sending them a text or a voice note or just a random phone call. But basically the idea is that by doing these exercises, you're kind of building and maintaining your network of luck. And then at some point down the line, good serendipitous things, lucky things will start to happen to you. Technique number three, become more approachable. Now this is again something interesting that he talks about in the book. The idea that when he was doing his studies, he and his research team, they could kind of tell at first glance who, who were the people that would consider themselves lucky and who were the people that would consider themselves unlucky because the lucky people just tended to be more cheerful and open body language and optimistic and just seemed to seem to be happier broadly. Whereas the unlucky people tend to be more closed off and a little bit more stressed and anxious looking. And the theory here is that generally, you know, because lucky events happen, because we're exposed to, we bump into serendipitous interactions with different kinds of people, we are far more likely to get lucky events happening to us if we become the sorts of people that are more approachable. So if our body language is friendly and open and we're warm and we smile at people rather than scowl and frown and just sit in our phones whenever we're out in public, if you're the sort of person who has warm and approachable body language, someone might come up and talk to you or be more inclined to talk to you and that's 
that's how lucky events happen to us. Technique number four, set lucky goals. Now, basically the idea here is that when setting goals, setting goals is a good thing, all the evidence shows it, it shows it, but when setting goals, you wanna try and set goals that are optimistic rather than pessimistic. Like goals that are kind of assuming that you're going to be luckier than maybe you feel. Now, the idea here is not that you wanna set totally unrealistic goals, but generally, annoyingly, all the evidence kind of shows that when you set an optimistic goal or when you set an ambitious target, you're A, more likely to work towards hitting that target and you're more likely to actually achieve that target than if you set a more conservative, pessimistic one. And there is kind of a balance here. Like my, my issue with goals has always been that like, if you set an ambitious goal, it's very easy to tie your own personal self-worth to the accomplishment of that goal. And so if you don't hit the goal, then it starts to feel really bad. And kind of what I've realized over time is when it comes to setting goals, it is absolutely fine to set an ambitious, optimistic goal, but at the same time, recognizing that A, the journey is more important than the destination in terms of getting to the goal. B, enjoying the journey is more important than like reaching reaching the destination. And also trying to not like attach or be too attached to the outcome. So it's like having a goal, but being non-attached to the outcome, I think is how we get the best of both worlds here. And technique number five is to look on the bright side. So if you ever struggle with things in life, then try and look out for the silver lining. And again, there's so much evidence about this. This, like gratitude journaling, all this kind of stuff, that when you focus on the good things that are happening, even if something really bad happens, if you focus on the good that came out of it, and like the fact it was a learning opportunity, reframing failure as learning, for example, that then helps you bounce back from negative events and become more resilient. And therefore kind of that's the trait that these lucky people in all these studies seem to have. But if you didn't know, I actually have a series of exclusive interviews that I did with authors, academics, entrepreneurs, and creators. And those are available on Nebula. Now, if you don't know, Nebula is an independent streaming platform that's built by me and a Bunch of other creators. And the nice thing about Nebula is that it's not trying to be a competitor to YouTube, but it's a place where we can put more long form, more in-depth content without having to necessarily worry about the YouTube algorithm. And so for example, on Nebula, I have these exclusive interviews, but you also get access to a bunch of exclusive content from other creators that you might be familiar with, like Thomas Frank and Wendover Productions and Legal Eagle and Lindsay Ellis and Tom Scott. And the best way to sign up for Nebula is actually by signing up to Curiosity Stream, who are very kindly sponsoring this video. Curiosity Stream is the world's leading documentary streaming subscription platform founded by John Hendricks, who's the founder of the Discovery Channel. And on Curiosity Stream, they've got thousands of high quality, high budget documentaries that you can watch whenever you feel like it. And one of the great things about Curiosity Stream is that they love independent creators. And so they've partnered with us at Nebula. And so if you sign up to a one year plan for Curiosity Stream, which is less than $15 for the whole year, then you get free access to Nebula bundled with that. And so for less than $15 for the whole year, you get all of these incredible high quality documentaries, but you also get all of my exclusive content, along with the exclusive content of a bunch of other educational creators that you might be familiar with. And that makes is the single best deal in the streaming world. So if that sounds up your street, then head over to curiositystream.com forward slash Ali. And if you sign up on that link, then your Nebula details will be emailed to you. And you can check out all of these other really sick interviews that I did over the last couple of years. Anyway, if you like this video about how to make more luck in your life, then you might like this video over here, which is how to make more time in your life. This is my book club episode of a fantastic book called Make Time by Jake Knapp and John Zaratsky. And that's a summary of the book over there. So thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.